Bodo Weber, it's great for you to join us today in Pristina Insights editorial room. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Thank you uh, for having me. It's always a pleasure. So, Bodo, you recently wrote a report that's about Kosovo called Trading Democracy for Resolving Status Disputes. Can you summarize what does that mean? The basic argument, what it came down was, you know, first to, to end a very long crisis, which put a lot of issues on hold, special court, other issues, dialogue. And uh, I mean, it, it basically added to freezing the dialogue for the whole of 2014, but also, you know, being afraid of, you know, what would happen to the dialogue if, if Vetevan Dossier would enter with the opposition coalition in, into government. So the basic argument here was, um, dialogue over, you know, staying away from interfering into, into some of the basic elements of parliamentary democracy, liberal democracy is, you know, forming a government based on election results and association among parties, forming coalitions. So at this point, would you say that, you know, the idea even of trading democracy in order to resolve a status dispute, it seems to me that uh, this trading of democracy has not actually contributed to resolve resolution of the status dispute. Well, you know, I mean, the, we got a very screwed up situation in the way that, um, of course, there, there are actors on the opposition side that, in their acting, uh, give a perfect pretext, even after this whole dialogue and the, and the new dialogue we have, the, the new crisis, for um, Western actors to still perceive that they had they have no other option, you know, because the other political actors are just, cannot be partners. So it's a very, you know, that's, that creates, I would say, a, a, a perfect, complete deadlock because, you know, you know that your current corporation partner on, on the political sectors in the region, in, in Kosovo and Serbia, are not ideal from a democracy and a rule of law point of view, but, but it, it creates a sense of, or being without alternative, you know. So what should the international community do in the face of the current deadlock? Should the international community have a role to play current in, the, in breaking the current deadlock or not? They created that mess, so they should be the one to come up with fixing it uh, if it can be fixed locally, which I don't truly see it. I mean, I didn't see it throughout the last year. Don't see it yet, so... Um, that is one reason, and the other one is, uh, I'm reluctant to answer this question, is at the end, I don't even think uh, the very concrete idea is important. I think what, what is crucial is whatever, you know, starting your starting point is, maybe right or wrong, but the basic uh, question is of uh, whether you have the political will to really deal with these issues on the one side. And currently, unfortunately, the focus of the West, of the EU and US, is not on the Balkans. That's a key problem. So the, the level of political, high level political engagement is not there, or not high enough. What can you say about the EU's definition or its policy of facilitation, you know, only discussing uh, topics of mutual interest? I mean, can there be mere facilitation uh, when there's a dialogue of two unequal parties? This whole process only at least started whether it's successfully dragging on is another question because of uh, political leadership by Germany combined with the UK and, and, and the US. This had nothing to do with facilitation. It was uh, taking leadership, moving the EU from a divided actor that basically was a non-actor since independence, leaving the US in a lead and basically alone as a Western actor to you know, taking the EU in, in, into its hand based on a coalition of the willing Germany, UK and others, turning it into an actor based on a dictate. We basically turned around Serbia's game of saying, you know, playing on, on the theme of a divided EU, pretending both towards the EU and internally that they could get both at the end, EU and Kosovo, which of course they knew. It, it, it's a joke, it's not real. So turning this around and Serbia's EU aspiration and saying, you know, forget about border changes, forget about Kosovo, the fact that Kosovo is gone, um, and you still have institutions there of the Serbian state, so if you want to enter into the EU, you need to. And that was basically the 2011, August 2011 messaging of Chancellor Merkel saying, you know, Kosovo is gone, and you need to unravel your state institutions in Kosovo until you want to 
entering into the EU face the reality and that's basically, you know, that had nothing to do with facilitation. The worst violence that we've seen in any of these opposition protests came in the wake of the Constitutional Court decision uh, in its assessment of the deal on the main elements and general principles of the to-be-created Association of Serb-Majority Municipalities. What can you say about uh, the fact that the court actually found uh, that all five chapters or components of the association of the deal, that the court found them unconstitutional. And how should this be treated by the EU uh, in its facilitation role? I, mean, I think that's something to remind uh, also Western diplomats when they assail on the opposition uh, for their exercise of violence. Uh, I think in theory of violence, there are two forms of violence. It's direct physical violence and there are other indirect forms of violence and there's legal violence can be a form of violence, political violence. So I think that we have seen both here. So I would, uh, I think you, you get closer to a solution when, when, you, when you don't ignore the other forms of violence that we have seen here that are not physical and have not been uh, exercised on the street. Um, there has been a lot of legal violence, I would say, over the last two or three years, some of them done ex exercised by local actors and some with Western involvement, some not even public yet. Um, so diplomats know what I'm talking about. Mm. But the other element which really surprises me is the Constitutional Court ruled the, 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 the application by the President ad admissible. Um, they, they, they said they are in charge of this. But at the same time, they, they clarified, they, they, they um, defined the, the August Agreement as non, not being a legal document. So I, 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 at least as an interested uh, uh, analyst, ask myself if, 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 if this is not a legal document, uh, and that sounds to me r r correct, then what, what, does the, the, what, uh, what does the Constitutional Court have to do with it? From my discussion with the EU officials that um, this August 25 agreement was based on a draft done by some lawyers in the AAS. So, I mean, these lawyers must have at least taken a look at, at the Constitution of Kosovo and, and the Atisari Agreement, you know. And now, okay, you can say, I mean, it's a normal thing in, in, in democratic countries that uh, some of the laws that governments draft are turned down by, by, by a constitutional court, but uh, there are much, uh, many fundamental things in there I mean, that has been defined by the judgment as anti-constitutional. So, I mean, that opens an interesting question, though, if, I think this is a worrying trend if the EU you know, just says, you know, we can continue moving towards progress and we know why they are doing this, they are, you have new troubles coming up. This, I think this is again coming back to, to the original theme of my report and your question of what is the damage, the collateral damage of trading democracy and the rule of law for, for the dialogue. This is a key issue here in constitutional uh, legal matters and I mean, we didn't even speak on this. Uh, on the Serbian side, basically, we know that the April Agreement is not in accordance with the, with the Serbian constitution because it's basically integrating into Kosovo Republic state institutions, police and judiciary, so this is not in accordance with the Serbian constitution. And we on the EU side were happy for the Serbian government since 2013 to pressure their constitutional court in Belgrade not to look into the documents. I mean this, while at the same time we next year or this year probably will open chapter 23 on the rule of law in Serbia and judicial reform. And I mean, again, you know, how do you bring those things strategically together in five or seven or eight years, wanting to, to have Serbia enter as a full new EU member with a functioning rule of law? So these are all these strategic questions which I think are not properly addressed. Bodo Weber, thank you so much for joining us in our newsroom for a chat. Thank you again for having me.